Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, Facebook Live, YouTube, Instagram. Good evening, conference call line. This is the 15th day of the third month of the 22nd year of the third decade of this century and third millennium, March 15th, 2022. We are inching ever more closely to the first day of springtime, which will be Sunday, the 20th of March, at least on our calendars. Whether you know it or not, we are already in spring meteorologically. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. That's why we have the tug of war between winter and spring. Winter doesn't want to relent, but winter will have to retreat. And you will see in short order, the retreat will be in effect. And we will have six months, essentially, of a growing season of warm weather and we thank God for it. We've been looking forward to this, but I pray that you have also enjoyed winter. Every season has its beauty and every season has its purpose. That's what we are told in Ecclesiastes chapter three, and it is certainly something that I embrace and I pray that you will, if you haven't already, you will. Tonight we're going deeper into God's word and we will take our stand in scripture in Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. But before we read the lesson and share, let's pray. Gracious, ever living, ever lasting, ever loving God, our savior, we do thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that this day has unfolded to be a beautiful day. And now we are in the evening of this day. And you've been good to us every step of the way. We know that some have had challenges. Some have been distressed. Some have gotten what we call bad news. But we know, God, that all things work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And we know that you can even take the bad and bring something good out of it. And we trust you for it. We ask you, God, to bless your word tonight. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We thank you for your written word. And we pray now that we will take our buckets and let them down deeply into your well, and that we will bring forth living water. We love you and we praise you and we thank you for those who are assembled in real time and those who will enjoy this lesson later on this week. Thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned in passing Sunday that the surest route home is not necessarily a straight line. There are times when we have to take a twist or a turn or a detour in order to ensure our ultimate progress. And such is the study of God's word. It seems sometimes when we are in a sermon series, a series of lessons, that we should just continue uninterruptedly but uh, that's not how it always works. When we're in the season of Lent, we essentially look at the highlights of Jesus' ministry as he prepares to make the ultimate sacrifice. 
pay the price, the sin debt for humanity on Calvary. So the first week of Lent, we looked at the temptation narrative. We looked at how Jesus was tempted by the adversary, the Satan, the accuser in the wilderness. On the second week of Lent, we look at Jesus' steeled determination to complete what he began. Keep in mind, Jesus didn't have essentially 33 years uh, to minister. Jesus only had three and a half years. The first 30 years of his life, especially uh, from the age of 12 to the age of 30, those 18 years were spent in obscurity. We don't know what Jesus really did. We don't know how uh, he operated, if you will. But we know that because he was a devout Jew, practicing Judaism, that he could not go public with ministry until the age of 30. That was the requirement at the time. That no rabbi, no teacher could publicly minister until they reached the age of 30. And that's when Jesus presented himself to his cousin, John the Baptizer, at the Jordan River. And when Jesus was baptized, Jesus began a three and a half year public ministry. Jesus understood his assignment and he even understood that there would be obstacles in his way. And that's probably one of the things that we don't completely understand. When we give proverbially the preacher our hand and Jesus our heart. I think that some of us think that uh, life with Jesus should just be a bed of roses without any thorns, uh, without any interruptions, without any obstruction, without any heartache, without any heartbreak. But those things come along with the assignment. The good news is Jesus is with us. He's with us in every struggle. He's with us in every test. He's with us in every trial. Yes, every temptation. Jesus is with us in the struggle. And that's what makes the difference. So we admire Jesus' character. This is one of the things. We, we know that Jesus is faithful. He is faithful. Filled <laughs> with faith. Full of faith. That Jesus has integrity. That we can rely and depend on him. We know that Jesus is compassionate and we know that Jesus is understanding. But we also know that Jesus challenges us to grow. He finds us where we are and doesn't condemn us for where we are, but he challenges us to move from where we are to where we ought to be. And we have to appreciate that. Because if we were left to our own devices, we would fail. We would faint. We would never complete our mission. We would fall short of our potential. And yes, we would die. And not merely a physical death, but we would die spiritually. 
So this is one of the reasons why we spend these 40 days, the 40 days of Lent, the season of Lent, exploring the character, the purpose, the commitment, the love, the dedication, the determination of Jesus. So last week we were in chapter four of Luke's gospel. Tonight we are in chapter 13. And next week we'll be at another portion. We may go back and forth until we arrive at the foot of the cross and ultimately the empty tomb. So just enjoy the ride. We'll get where we're going. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, I will begin reading at verse 31 and will conclude the lesson at verse 35. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word. Your version may read a bit differently, but we are depending on the Holy Spirit of God to help us arrive at the same point of understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 13, beginning at verse 31. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is a short passage, a short pericope, uh, a uh, concise reading of the conclusion, if you will, of the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to say more about this 13th chapter actually next week. And then I'll come back next week and uh, add the end of the chapter to what we will discuss through the proclamation, what we will proclaim through the sermon on Sunday. But in verse 31, we see something that uh, we need to note. Some Pharisees. Now, typically, we have come to know these people as religious leaders who opposed Jesus. But this verse said, some Pharisees. So that lets us know that all of the Pharisees were not in diametric opposition to what Jesus was teaching and preaching and what he was sharing with the people through his ministry. They may not have may not have had the courage of Jesus. And they may have been a part of a reformation movement within the Pharisaic party. They knew that uh, 
the way they operated, at least some of them did, the way they operated did not advance the cause of the human condition, did not give them the moral authority to really stand before the people and did not give them the voice for the voiceless and did not permit them to speak truth to power because they had negotiated, if you will, an understanding and a relationship and a deal with the Roman Empire that if the Romans would leave them alone and if they could control the masses of the Jewish people, then the Pharisees and the Sadducees <laughs> could uh, do whatever they wanted to do. Just as long as they kept the people from rebelling and revolting against the Roman Empire. Because the alternative was, if the masses of the people revolted against the empire, the empire would come down with an iron fist and would confiscate their land, burn their buildings, imprison, exile, and execute people. That was the ruthlessness of the Roman government. Because Rome had decided that they were going to rule by force. It's one of the reasons why uh, they used the cross as the instrument of capital punishment and they did not make uh, the uh, punishment a sequestered or private event. They hanged people publicly. They disgraced them. And the instrument of crucifixion, the, the death instrument, the death penalty that was issued by Rome was used to intimidate people not to cross the line and never to threaten the authority of Rome. It sounds like something that we are seeing right before our eyes today. It would seem that uh, would-be despots and dictators would read history and be sobered by its lessons, chastened and humble. But no, <laughs> evil is, 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 is brutal. Evil is also cunning. Uh, but evil always overplays its hand and evil is insane and evil is self-destructive. There are people that think that they can get away with things, that they can do a dastardly deed better than the person before them who was caught. And it never turns out well, ever. And it's not going to turn out well now. It just won't work. But in the meantime, there is a lot of suffering that people have to endure, don't they? A lot of displacement, a lot of dislocation. And our hearts break for them. And I pray that our hearts break for those in Yemen and those in Syria, and those in Ethiopia, and every place else where there is a, an iron fist and an iron hand of authoritarianism. So we see in this particular passage that some of the Pharisees knew better. Maybe all of them knew better, but some of them wanted to do better. 
They just didn't have the courage. And what they really wanted was for Jesus to feel the same kind of intimidation that they felt. So they wanted the fear that they had of the Romans, they wanted Jesus to have. And Herod, representing the Herodian party, Herod was a representative of the Roman Empire, put in place by the Romans to rule over those in Palestine, but especially the Jewish population. This is the same family out of which old Herod came, who wanted to kill Jesus as a baby. Uh, the, the father of this Herod, but this particular Herod uh, had dealings with John the baptizer. And uh, he was intrigued by John. As a matter of fact, John was working on him and his conscience was being quickened. He loved to hear John preach. Wasn't that keen on doing what John said, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> but John got in trouble because John told Herod that he was wrong by taking his brother's wife. His brother was Philip. And uh, Herod had Philip moved out of the way some people say that he had him liquidated, <laughs> rubbed out, so that he could take his brother's wife. And that's what this Herod did. And her name was Herodias. I, I, I don't know if she assumed that name once she married Herod. And her daughter's name was also Herodias, but she was known as Salome. And uh, when Herodias found out that John the baptizer was messing in their personal affairs, she developed a hatred toward him and wanted him silenced. So Herod threw himself a party for his birthday and uh, invited all of the folks, uh, all of the yes people to surround him and to prop him up and make him feel good. And then he had a little too much to drink. And uh, he called on his daughter, Salome, AKA Herodias Jr. to perform a dance. And she danced sensually and stirred him up so much that he told her after her performance that he would give her half of the kingdom <laughs> as a reward for her dance. Now, you know, that was a lot of gyrating and twerking. Lord have mercy. <laughs> so Salome, Herodian, Herodias Jr., goes to her mama and says, what should I ask for? You, you're already married to him, so whatever uh, he has, we have. And Herodias, the elder, said, ask for John the Baptist's head on a platter, Lord have mercy. And that's what Salome Herodias Jr. asked for. And uh, Herod never wanted to kill John the baptizer, but he would have looked like a chump in front of all of his friends. 
and uh, all of his soldiers if he had gone back on his word. So he had John the Baptist executed and had his head dripping with blood placed on a platter. Some people say it was a silver platter and it was brought to Herodias and subsequently John's disciples retrieved his body and buried his body. So when Jesus became prominent, Herod was petrified. Herod thought that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. And according to the report of these Pharisees who were sympathetic to Jesus, who were afraid themselves and afraid for Jesus, Herod had a contract out on Jesus' life. Now, you know that is the craziest thing in the world. We can't even imagine it. But, but just for the sake of conversation, humor me. If one of us had killed someone and they rose from the dead, do you think that we could kill them again? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. That's why I'm telling you, evil, sin is insane. And if, <laughs> if, if Herod thought that just by killing Jesus' body, he would rid himself of guilt, he didn't understand the operation of the Holy Spirit. Because the body might perish, but the spirit never dies. The spirit of God is alive forever. So Jesus told these sympathetic, sympathetic Paris, uh, Pharisees, tell that fox that I'm out here doing the work that God has called me to do on the first day, the second day, and the third day. And I'm not going to be deterred. I'm not going to be interrupted until I finish my assignment. Now that takes courage, doesn't it? But when you are sure of God, when you know that God has you in the witness protection program, when you know that God will hide your soul in the cleft of a rock <laughs> that shelters a dry, thirsty land, when you know that God hides your soul in the depths of God's love and covers you with God's hand, you're not afraid to speak truth to power. It's as, a, it is as if Jesus told the Pharisees, we, I know you're scared, but if you can muster up a little courage, go and tell Herod, come look for me. Because he can't touch me until God is through with me. Isn't that a wonderful way to live? You know, I want that kind of courage. How about you? And, and the longer we live, the less afraid we ought to be of anything except for breaking God's heart. <laughs> How are we going to be afraid of folks that, that don't have a heaven or a hell to put us in? Now, now understand, I'm not chastising. I, I'm not talking down. Because I've had to grow. <laughs> yeah, th there are people, I I I'll be honest, I can be transparent. There are people that used to intimidate me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. But, uh, but anytime any of us has stared death in the face, because see, death is life's final enemy. And if you have looked death in the face even once in your life and death blinked, you ought not to be afraid of anything or anybody. You just ought not be. You can be respectful. You can, and I'm not saying going out, running your mouth and, and, and being foolish and that kind of thing. But, but, but you just ought not be afraid like you once were. You ought not to be afraid to live and too scared to die. <laughs> you just ought not be. And this is how Jesus lived his life. He did not live his life intimidated by life and by people. Because he understood what was behind all of it. He knew it was the enemy. A lot of people get caught up, they get entangled in the web of the enemy and they become useful idiots for the enemy. And, and some of them are not idiots. Some of them know what they're doing and they like to be used by the enemy. But keep in mind, it's not, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness <laughs> and, 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 and crazy and insane negative forces that are in high places, in high places. And when you and I come to understand that this thing is more spiritual than it is physical and God gives us the equipment to fight in the spirit, we'll be so much better off. We will live in victory. We will live with courage. And we will not be afraid. Remember I told you uh, a few months ago, I guess it was a few months ago, it was sometime uh, when the pandemic was really kicking high. I, I shared that the phrase fear not or do not be afraid appears in the Bible from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation 366 times. once for every day of the regular year, and then once for the, ye the leap year day. God encourages us not to be afraid. And then somebody took pen to paper, some, some, some uh, poet, Put these words in hymnody, in hymn form. Be not dismayed, whate'er betides, God will take care of you. Beneath God's wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Yeah. So uh, we've got to deal with the fear factor. We, we've got to deal with it because if we don't deal with the fear factor, we will live beneath our privilege and beneath our purpose and beneath the power that God has given us. In Psalm 37, we're told, fret not thyself because of evildoers and be not envious of those who work iniquity. 
In Psalm 27, we're told, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Jesus was not afraid. Even though these sympathetic Pharisees uh, were dealing with their own fear. Jesus says, I, I'm performing, I'm not going to perform my ministry in, in, in the back, in the booth, in the corner, and in the dark. I'm going to do this in the bright light of daytime, in public. And I'm going to keep going until I accomplish my work. And then he goes on to tell them, he says, you know, no prophet has died outside of Jerusalem. I've got to get to Jerusalem. I'm bound for Mount Zion. I've got to get there. Because there is a price that only I can pay for humanity. And then Jesus sings a lament. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills its prophets and stones those who speak the liberating truth. How many times has God wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you have refused. Nonetheless, that's where I have to go. That's where the price has got to be paid. That's where the debt must be settled. Thank God that Jesus did not fall short. Thank God that Jesus did not stop short of the goal line. He not only got in the red zone, but he got in the end zone. <laughs> but then Jesus leaves them with these cryptic words. And we find them in verse 35. Uh, Jesus says, see, your house is left to you. That means that, that the facade of, of, of religion that that is masquerading for spirituality is not about God. That's your, that's your stuff. These are your made up rules and regulations. These are your traditions. And you may think that they're good, but there's no God in them. That's your stuff. And then Jesus says, you're not going to hear from me again. Until you hear these words, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, there are those who think that Jesus is talking about his resurrection, but in this particular context, Jesus is talking about his triumphal entry into Jerusalem so that he can pay the price. He's on his way. His mother attempted to stop him. His brothers and sisters attempted to stop him. His disciples, as well mean as, as they were, attempted to stop him. You know the devil attempted to stop him. <laughs> but I can just hear Jesus in my imagination and in, in the song of the church say, if you can't help me, please don't stop me. Move out of my way. Don't try to block me. I've got a race to run and I'm running by faith and at the finishing line, I'm going to see God's face. I, I wish somebody would just make up their mind uh, to, to go on. Uh, to, to, to walk on, to, to, to move on. I, I wish somebody would make up their mind to look up and live 
Somebody, I wish, would make up their mind to finish what they have begun. If you have a made up mind and if you have a determination in Jesus, I want to let you know you will have the energy and you will have the power. It doesn't matter what obstacle might be in your way. You will make it. You'll make it. You'll make it. Whenever you get a little discouraged, whenever you get a little tired, catch this word that has come from uh, our uh, wonderful tradition of, of worship. Lord, I'm running trying to make a hundred. Ninety-nine and a half won't do. Don't you stop short. Don't, 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 you, don't you fail to make the mark. You can do it. You can do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Jesus is our template. Jesus is our model. Jesus is our exemplar. Jesus is what we need. Anybody know that's the truth? By faith, just reach out and, and grab hold. The song says he will carry you through. Do you believe that? You don't have to live in the land of regret. You don't have to live in the land of incomplete. You can be made complete, made whole. You can run your race. You can finish your course. Yes, you can. You can do it. Because we have somebody in our lives who has done it. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available. As a matter of fact, it is in us. In, in many instances, it is dormant. But it can be stirred up. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. Don't let anybody discourage you. Don't let anybody turn you to the right or to the left. Don't let anybody pour rain on your parade. I'm telling you, you have victory in Jesus. You have it. You have it. Now I'm grateful for this passage of scripture. Go back and read it. Reflect on it. Meditate on it and make up your mind that you're going to finish what you have started in Jesus. <laughs> You've been in deep water. Don't drown in shallow water. You're too close to the shore now. You can make it. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We praise you for your love, your commitment, your determination, your stick to itiveness. Your faithfulness is great unto us. Lord, with our lives hanging in the balance, with eternity hanging in the balance, you refused to stop until you reached your goal, which has become our victory. Help us to continue to walk with you and talk with you as you assure us that you are our own. We absolutely love you, but we need grace to love you more. We know that these are turbulent times. But you have declared that there would be wars and rumors of wars. Spiritual wickedness in high places. We shouldn't be astounded. But we should know that in the midst of this all, 
in the midst of all of this, you are. And you're going to work everything out. The wicked will cease from troubling and the weary will be at rest. Help us to stand on your side. And help us to proclaim good news. Help us to share love. Help us to offer a helping hand. Help us to brighten the corner where we are. And we know you won't forget about us. Somebody needs a healing touch. Somebody needs a breakthrough. Somebody needs the finances fixed. Somebody needs peace of mind. Somebody needs fresh courage. Somebody needs to drop a grudge. Somebody needs to lose fear and pick up hope. Do your work, have your way. And while on others thou art calling, do not pass us by. We'll be ever so grateful to give you the glory and the honor which is justly your due. We love you and we praise you and we thank you. And we don't have to be afraid of the big bad wolf and nothing else. You did not give us the spirit of fear. You gave us the spirit of love and power and a sound mind. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If there's someone who is listening tonight and they want to accept your offer of relationship, May they just say, Jesus, come into my heart. And if you let him in today, he'll come in to stay. And if you want to be a part of this church family, inbox me. Give us indication in the comment section. Go on our Facebook page and make your request known. We thank you and we love you, Lord, for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God and thank God. I'm not going to leave you without a song tonight. I don't get a chance to play sometimes on Sundays the whole song, but uh, I'm going to play all of this song tonight, and I pray that it will bless you as it continues to bless me. Bound for Mount Zion, way out on a hill, if anybody is going to make it, Surely I will. will it Let me start it from the beginning. Here we go. This is my husband's favorite song. Well, I'm bound for my Zion. Way out.
You can put your hands together. Way out. I'm going to make it. How about you? The Lord's been good. Been good. got to have a made up mind. Do I have one witness? <laughs> make up your mind that you're going to make it. And if you make up your mind, Je see Jesus has already made up his mind for us that he's going to help us make it. God has already 
decided that God is going to help us. The apostle Paul says in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? I just wish that you'd make up your mind. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be personal and I'm not being selfish, but I have made up my mind. And I pray that somebody else has made up their mind. Join us Thursday night, if you'd like, on the Fellowship Hour conference call line, 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Join us Friday night for prayer from 7 o'clock until about 8 on the conference call line. And then join us Sunday morning. It'll be the third Sunday in the season of Lent at the halfway point of the Lenten season. It's also trustee ministry day at Calvary. Come in, per in person or join us on YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram, or the conference call line. Love you. Rest well in Jesus name. Amen.